All right, welcome to this final session in the letter of Colossians. Here Paul gives largely greetings to and from members of the Christian community. That's the heart of this little section. And what's really interesting about that is this, is there are more greetings in here in Colossians than in any other of Paul's letters which is fascinating in view of the fact that Paul didn't start this church, had never been to this church, didn't know these people hardly at all, and yet there's more greetings here to them than anywhere else. Why is that? I suspect it's because Paul is just trying to establish some rapport and some connection with him and with them. Uh, he always worked in a team. It's really important, actually. We'll see all these different names and their members of Paul's ministry team. Paul always worked in a team as ministry, and so he wanted to introduce uh, members of his team to the Christian community in Colossae so they knew who all was with them and who was a part of the work and who was involved in praying for them and all of that. And so I suspect because of the lack of relational connection, that's actually the reason why we have more greetings here, so that Paul can establish a little more relational connection and a little more partnership between them as he introduces his team to them. So with that, let's jump in and just look at uh, this particular section, Colossians 4, 7 through 17. And it has really three chunks. First uh, chunk are the letter bearers. That is, who's who the mailman, who bring in the letter to the Colossians. Uh, the second chunk will be greetings from Paul's companions, so just members of that team that he's introducing them to and they're sending their greetings. And then the last chunk uh, will be greetings to members at Colossae that Paul actually knows, and so he will greet specific uh, individuals there in Colossae. All right, so let's take the first chunk, the letter bearers, those uh, who, are, who are mailing the letter or delivering the letter to the church at Colossae. The first one mentioned is Tychicus. The second one mentioned is a bit of a surprise. Let's read what he says. He says, Now, as to all my affairs, Tychicus, our beloved brother and faithful servant and fellow bondservant in the Lord, will bring you information. And so Tychicus is going to deliver this letter, but he's also going to be able to answer any questions they have about Paul, Paul's imprisonment, Paul's situation. Does Paul wait for trial? What's going on with Paul? He's going to fill them in on Paul's circumstance. Notice how Tychicus is described. He's described as our beloved brother and faithful servant and fellow bond servant in the Lord. And so Tychicus is a colleague and partner in ministry, a faithful servant of Paul, and he's going to deliver uh, the letter as well as some news about Paul to them. In verse 8, Paul amplifies this. He says, For I have sent him to you for this very purpose, that you may know about our circumstances, and that he may encourage your hearts. And so one of the whole reasons Paul wanted to send Tychicus with the letter is because Tychicus really had an understanding of Paul, Paul's ministry, Paul's imprisonment, Paul's situation, and he could be a good one to just explain to them what's going on with Paul and help them know uh, really his circumstances and how it's going. And so Paul says, I've sent him for that purpose. Now, next we get a surprise in verse 9. Someone else who's delivering the letter and who's going along with Tychicus. And that is a fellow by the name of Onesimus. Let's read. It says, and with him, Onesimus. And so along with Tychicus is coming Onesimus, our faithful and beloved brother who is one of your number. They will inform you about the whole situation here. All right, now, we already talked about them informing them about Paul's circumstances, but who is this Onesimus and why is he a surprise? Well, again, it's directly connected to the letter of Philemon, and so you can check out the commentary on Philemon to learn more about Onesimus and what's going on there. But in short, Onesimus was a slave in Philemon's house, the church in Colossae meets in Philemon's house, and Onesimus, for some reason, had fled from Philemon's house, had made contact with Paul. At the time, he wasn't yet a believer when he left. Now he's coming back from Paul, and he's a believer being described as a faithful and beloved bro brother who's a member of your number, who's one of your numbers, from you. Uh, that's why he's a surprise. One, that he's coming back, and like, oh, there's Onesimus. Two, he's coming back in good standing with a basically a recommendation from the Apostle Paul as a faithful and beloved brother. And so that's surprising. So, so Tychicus and Onesimus are 
coming to Colossae, delivering the letter to Colossians. They're also going to deliver the letter to Philemon. And uh, Onesimus is returning home. I imagine there's a little fear and trepidation for him at this moment. How will he be received? What will people think? How will Philemon respond? Because Philemon is his slave master. So what's going to happen to Onesimus? So I imagine there's a little fear with him, but they're coming, delivering the letters, and they are also going to inform the church there in Colossae about how things are with Paul, what his situation is, what his circumstances are. Now, the next major group we have here are greetings from Paul's companions. That is from Paul's ministry team who are with him, who are continuing doing ministry. It's a way of introducing his team to them, again, to kind of knit them together a little bit, build a little bit more rapport, a little bit more partnership and connection. And so Paul then offers greetings from members of his team, his colleagues in ministry, his companions who are with him. The first one mentioned is Aristarchus. So verse 10 Aristarchus, my fellow prisoner, sends his greeting. So Aristarchus is, is sounds like is under arrest with Paul. So he's whatever Paul's circumstances, Aristarchus is enduring it with him, right? He's he's in prison with Paul, and so he sends his greetings. Uh, we know about Aristarchus from uh, Acts chapter twenty, and there we're, we learn that he's from Thessalonica. And that he's been one of Paul's traveling companions for a period of time, at least, in Paul's ministry. And he, he was traveling with Paul back to Jerusalem when Paul was initially arrested that led to his arrest in Rome. We're guessing that's the circumstance. I'm trying to piece it all together, although we don't know 100%. So Aristarchus is a Christian, uh, originally from Thessalonica, who has been a traveling ca companion of Paul for a little bit. Um, next, he mentions... Um, this, he says, and also Barnabas's cousin Mark, about whom you received instructions, if he comes to you, welcome him. Well, that's interesting. This assumes, one, that they know who Barnabas is, that they've at least heard of him, they're familiar with Barnabas, or some such thing as that. Otherwise, why mention Mark as Barnabas's cousin? So apparently they, they knew a little bit about Barnabas, so uh, and they had heard about him. Notice you received some instructions about him, so they had heard about him before. So Mark, Barnabas's cousin, also sends you greetings, um, and they received instructions that if he actually comes to them, they, they need to give him a warm welcome. So that's been the recommendation, is to welcome Mark when he comes. Now, what's interesting about the mention of Mark is this. If you're familiar with the story of, of Paul and his conversion and then his early ministry from the book of Acts, you know that Mark went with Paul and Barnabas on Paul and Barnabas's first missionary journey that's recorded in Acts 13 and 14. You also would know, if you read those chapters, that at some point in that journey, uh, Mark turned tail, went back home, and it, it was for apparently a very, at least from Paul's perspective, a very unhelpful, poor reason. And it led to some tension between Paul and Barnabas at some point, uh, I personally think it led to some tension between Paul and the Jerusalem church, and that's what led to the uh, the Jerusalem conference recorded in Acts 15. Uh, in fact, I tend to think that the reason Bar uh, Mark left was because Paul began doing ministry directly to Gentiles apart from the synagogue, and that was something that really hadn't been done a whole lot before, and Mark was very uncomfortable with that because he was from the mother church in Jerusalem, and he knew that that would be looked down upon, and I'm not so sure how he felt about it. That's all speculation, educated guesses, all right? Whatever the reason was, there was a rift at that point in time between uh, Mark and Paul, a rift that was so deep and so bad that it actually led to a ministry split between uh, Paul and Barnabas for a little bit. And so to see Mark mentioned here is encouraging because what it means is Mark and Paul have, uh, you know, reconciled, they've worked through things, they've come to a greater understanding of each other and ministry, and they're able to work in ministry again. And uh, Mark himself may actually come to Colossae to help kind of continue the ministry of Paul and Paul's team there. That's good news to see this practical outworking of the gospel between uh, Mark and Paul. Uh, next, Paul mentions a guy named Jesus who's called Justice, verse 11. Uh, another guy that greets him is a guy named Jesus who's called Justice. You can understand why uh, Jesus might go through go by his middle name, you know, since he didn't want to be totally identified with Jesus, the Lord Jesus Christ. And so he's, he's preferred to go by his name, Justice, and he sends his greetings. And then Paul says, 
These are the only fellow workers for the kingdom of God who are from the circumcision, and they have proved to be an encouragement to me. And so what he's saying by that is these are the only Jewish um, co-workers in ministry that Paul has, and they have been a great encouragement to him. And so that tells us Aristarchus, Justus, and Mark are all Jews. They're working with Paul in ministry, and they've been a huge encouragement to Paul because of that. Um, then he lists off some others of his team who, since the, the this first set are Jews, these ones must be Gentiles, non-Jews, who are working with Paul as well. So he mentions Epaphras in verse 12. Epaphras actually is uh, the one who planted the church in Colossae, started it. We met him in Colossians chapter 1. Epaphras sends his greetings too. Epaphras, who is one of your number, from you, right? He's part of your church. Uh, and a bond slave of Jesus, that's just the word for servant or slave, bond slave, but they clarify the nature of the servanthood, that it's, it's, a, it's the kind of almost servant or slave that has said, I'm, I'm, I'm going to stick with you. I'm a voluntary servant or slave. So a bond servant of Jesus Christ sends his greetings. Notice this, what he says about Epaphras, always laboring earnestly for you in his prayers, that you may stand complete and fully assured in all the will of God. So notice that Paphras has such an investment in them and such an investment in them as a church that he's laboring earnestly for you in his prayers. I mean, he's working hard in prayer. And why? Because he wants them to be complete, mature, whole, and steady and steadfast in their faith in Christ. And so he knows that prayer is a centerpiece of that. And so he's praying, laboring in his prayers for them. Man, what an example for those of us who have groups of Christians we care for, whether it's pastors or small group leaders or some such thing as that. Let's follow Epaphras' example and uh, labor earnestly in our prayers for the people in our charge. He says in verse 13 about Epaphras, For I testify for him that he, is a, he has a deep concern for you. Like he deeply cares for you and is concerned for your well-being. And perhaps Paul throws that in to let them know that even though he didn't return with Tychicus and Onesimus, he stayed behind. That's not out of a lack of concern for them. He has a deep concern for them um, and has a deep concern for those who are in Laodicea and Hierapolis, two neighboring towns to Colossae, presumably that Epaphras maybe started churches in as well, or at least has some connection with the churches in. And so he's deeply concerned for the churches in those towns as well. And so he's praying for them. Next up for Paul to mention greetings from is Luke. Uh, Colossians 4.14, he says, Luke, the beloved physician. This is where we learn that Luke was a doctor. Uh, and Luke is also the author of the Gospel of Luke and the Book of Acts. And uh, he was with Paul in various parts of his ministry. You see it in the book of Acts when instead of saying Paul or them or they, he says we and us. And so that tells us that Luke was with him. And so he traveled with Paul on some of his ministry through this very region at various points in time. And so Luke, the beloved physician, sends you his greetings. And so Luke greets them, uh, as does Demas. And uh, Demas is just another member of Paul's team. We don't know a whole lot about Demas, except this. We know that he's mentioned again in 2 Timothy 4, 10 through 11. And at that point, um, he has, in some sense, been unfaithful to Paul. Uh, he's kind of abandoned Paul during a more dire and dark imprisonment there. And Paul actually attributes that because he loved this present world. And so, not sure what all that means about Demas, uh, we just know that as far as Paul is concerned, he was a little too caught up in the pleasures and comfort of this world, and he decided to uh, just, you know what, forget it, I'm out. And he abandoned Paul when Paul was in a really dire situation there in 2 Timothy chapter 4. That's Paul's team that he sends greetings to here at this point. Uh, and he greets the, the church in Colossae. All these people greet him, and now they at least have some understanding of uh, the members of Paul's team. Now, before we finish the uh, the section with with uh, greetings to the people in Colossae, just want to push pause and just again highlight the fact that look at all the names that are mentioned. These are people that Paul worked with in ministry. These are people that Paul taught and trained and equipped for ministry. That Paul then sent out for ministry. And we often think of Paul as this great, you know, solo. Uh, 
you know, missionary guy just taking the world, you know, by force for Jesus. But he always worked in a team. And he always worked with people. There's a variety of reasons for that. But you see the same thing in the book of Acts. There are people traveling with Paul on a regular basis that are part of his ministry team. And he sends them to various places on his behalf. Um, some of them, like Tychicus here, he sends letters with. Uh, they sometimes stay behind when he has to flee a city and they establish the church. He always worked in a team. Paul was not a lone ranger Christian. Paul was not a lone ranger servant of God or a lone ranger pastor or minister. He valued collaboration, cooperation, and teamwork. He valued developing other people for ministry and sending them out to ministry. And again, it's an example that we should pattern our lives and our ministries after. All right, now, in Colossians 4.15 then, Paul greets the members of the church at Colossae, uh, Colossae as well as the church at Laodicea. This is what he says, Colossians 4.15. Greet the brethren who are in Laodicea. So this neighboring town, this neighboring church, greet the brethren there. Greet the church there in Laodicea. And also greet Nympha and the church that is in her house. Who's Nympha? Well, um, Nympha is a lady, as best as we can tell by the name. She is a lady in Laodicea. And the church appears to meet in Nympha's house. Um, and so greet Nympha there in Laodicea and greet the whole church that is in her house. And so she's apparently a wealthy person in uh, Laodicea who has a big enough home to have the house gather at when they gather for their, their Sunday gatherings. And so greet the church in Laodicea, greet Nympha. Um, when this letter is read among you, have it also read in the church of the Laodiceans. Notice that. This is really important. This is, gives us a little insight into how these letters worked in the first century world. Paul's like, read this letter there in Colossae, but also take it to Laodicea and read it to them as well. I want them to hear the instructions and the truth of these letters. And so right from the beginning, Paul's letters were being circulated and passed around among uh, other churches and other Christians. And that explains why so early on in church history, like, Christians are quoting letters left and right, letters that weren't even written to the churches in their towns. Why? Because they were swapping and sharing letters amongst themselves for mutual encouragement and mutual growth. And so greet, um, not only greet the church at Laodicea, but also read them this letter and read the letter that he says, watch this, read the letter that's coming from them. And for you, for your part, read my letter that is coming from the Laodiceans. What letter is that? Like, read them your letter and read the letter that's coming from you. Well, what letter is that? Well, we don't know for sure. Could be a letter that Paul just wrote directly to Laodicea. Another really good possibility is that's actually the letter of Ephesians. We know that Ephesians is written and sent at the exact same time as Colossians and Philemon. So Ephesians, Colossians, Philemon all go together as sort of a package of letters. We know that uh, early manuscript evidence for Ephesians doesn't have, um, you know, to the church of Ephesians in the introduction. And so there's evidence that the letter of the Ephesians was originally intended to be a more circular letter that was passed along from the churches in and around Ephesus, of which Ephesus would have been the major city, the dominant city. It was one of the top four or five uh, cities in the Roman Empire. So it was a major city. And there were all these other cities that were sort of like sister cities to Ephesus, Laodicea being one of those cities. And in fact, a normal postal route would have gone in the order so that the last stop for any mail coming from Ephesus would have stopped at Laodicea, and then the next stop would have been Colossae. So it's quite possible the letter that's coming from Laodicea is Ephesians, and it's being circulated through the cities in that region. Quite possible. We just don't know for, for sure. What we do know is these letters were being circulated and passed amongst the churches right from the very beginning. That's helpful to us to understanding how these letters grew in really um, scope and in authority so quickly. So, Read these letters to each other. And then verse 17, he says, Say to Archippus, take heed to the ministry which you have received in the Lord, that you may fulfill it. Well, Archippus gets this very specific word of instruction here from Paul, something he really wants the uh, church there in uh, Colossae to say to him, to encourage him, and to challenge him. Who is Archippus? 
Well, we know a little bit more about him from Philemon. Philemon 2 suggests that he is a relative of Philemon himself, perhaps Philemon's son, who in some ways seems to have sort of like a central role in the church there in Colossae. Like he is, he, he seems to be sort of like, you know, a preacher, teacher, some sort of leader in the church. And so that's the reason for Paul's instruction to him here. Take heed to the ministry which you have received in the Lord. You've been given this ministry. Grab hold of it. Don't shy away from it. Don't back down from it. Take hold of it that you may fulfill the ministry that you have received in the Lord. And so now Paul has greeted the church in Colossae, greeted the church in Laodicea. He's encouraged them. And all that's left then is for Paul to sign off the letter, and he does so in verse 18 with these words. He says, I, Paul, write this greeting with my own hand. Remember my imprisonment. Grace be with you. And that's his sign-off. Now, just a couple observations. Notice, Paul says, I, Paul, write this greeting with my own hand. That might sound strange to us, uh, but it was fairly customary for what we can tell from Paul's letters, and it was almost fairly customary in the ancient world in a lot of letters, particularly formal letters. Um, and so there's probably a couple reasons for this. One is, as I noted, it's just fairly common in the ancient world. We, ha we have remains of letters from the Greco-Roman time period, the Roman Empire, where the, the last sentence or two is written in a different handwriting, which tells us that someone else was writing the last little bit. Not uncommon, where they would dictate the letter, they would speak it out loud, they would have somebody then copy it down as they dictated it, and then they would take up the pen at the very end and write the final bit of words. That was a fairly common practice in the ancient world. We know that the Apostle Paul practiced that, that he would dictate his letters and then he would sign off at the end. And so he's got somebody, maybe Timothy, maybe another scribe, somebody who is... Uh, listening to him speak the letter, and then he's writing it down. Part of that was almost a kind of a cultural assumption about letters, that they stood in for the person. They represented the person in his absence, and so they were viewed as um, hearing the person's voice, and they were always read out loud because of that. And so um, you would write this, and so speaking it was speaking with his voice because they were supposed to hear his voice on the other end. So that's part of it. I also think in Paul's case, there may have been another reason why he not only wrote the little bit, he drew attention to the fact that he wrote the little bit. I, Paul, write this greeting with my own hand. He drew attention to that. Why? Well, it seems like somehow fairly early on, some people tried to co-opt Paul's authority and Paul's ministry and write some false letters. We see this in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 where he mentions that there's been some sort of confusing message that has come to the Thessalonian church um, and he's not sure how it got there but one of the ways he speculates is by a letter as if from me he says in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Well, one important little historical note is that 2 Thessalonians is one of Paul's earliest letters. Uh, 1 and 2 Thessalonians were probably his two first letters. Maybe Galatians, some speculate, was before that. I don't think so. And so probably his first two letters that this happened. And so uh, Paul actually signs off 2 Thessalonians similar to how he does here in Colossians. He writes this. He says, I, Paul, write this greeting in my own hand, which is the distinguishing mark in all my letters. This is how I write. That's how Paul signs off 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 17. And so it seems like Paul then just adopted this custom of signing off on his own letters to make sure that basically it had his autograph so that people would know that they, they were dealing with the real thing, not a forgery. So we see the same thing, for example, in Galatians and elsewhere in Paul's writings that it seems to have been customary for Paul to do this. So, so Paul picks up the pen at this point in Colossians at verse 18. He uh, draws attention to the fact, here's my handwriting. I'm writing this in my own hand. And then his final instruction is, remember my imprisonment. That's the last thing he wants to say. Remember my imprisonment. Presumably to remember to pray for me in my imprisonment, as he invited just uh, earlier above. And then he says, grace be with you. This well wish for God's grace and kindness and favor to be upon you. And with that, Paul signs off the letter to Colossians.